I'm here with Jeremy Butterfield, who's a philosopher of physics at the University of Cambridge. And I'm here to ask him some questions about quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is a very counterintuitive theory. Um, for example, it seems to suggest that when you perform an experiment um, involving some particles, that while you're not looking, they behave differently from while you, when you look in. So could you explain that further, please? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's certainly weird. Uh, it certainly has the appearance of uh, a theory where the facts about a, an object, what physicists call a system, are different whether or not you're looking at it. Um, now, uh, of course, that's a little bit rough speaking, and uh, the, the I think the main the main th first thing to say would be to proceed in two steps to describe what is weird. Uh, one is um, the the first is an easy step. Uh, it was already, uh, it's a commonsensical idea that was actually um, in detail entrenched in physics before quantum theory. Uh, it's the common sense step that you might not know everything about the system. And when you don't know everything, you can use probabilities to uh, do your scientific description. And this occurred in the 19th century when physics began to make detailed studies of gases which have countless tiny parts which are hard to know the details about. So the vision there, which was extremely successful in something called statistical mechanics, was um, a gas consists of a countless number of molecules, but every individual molecule has uh, a definite value for position and for all the other quantities we know and love and need in physics, like velocity, speed, momentum, energy. But although it has those definite values, you couldn't possibly keep track of that. And you will use probabilities for the various possible uh, values and higher probabilities for when you're more confident of what the value is, lower probabilities for when you're less confident. So that's the commonsensical step of probabilities as describing ignorance. But the weirdness in quantum theory, uh, according to the standard way of thinking of quantum theory, there are other ways to think about it, but the weirdness of quantum theory comes in the second step. And this second step says uh, quantum systems, such as a molecule in a gas, they do not have uh, in general, they might sometimes, but they will not in general, most of the time, have a definite value for a quantity you might be interested in, such as energy or, or position. Uh, and if you were to measure the quantity you're interested in, of course, you've got a well-designed measuring instrument, so yes, you get an outcome, you get a, a result, uh, but that is not, even in a well-designed instrument, well correctly functioning, it is not revealing the previously existing value of the quantity. So there simply so, is no, like the particle has no position until you look. Exactly, until you measure. It, we say look for, make it vivid, but it means un, uh, until you measure. And that's true even if your measurement apparatus is completely well designed and functioning normally. That, that would be the orthodox way of thinking of quantum theory. But couldn't it just be that quantum theory is simply not a complete theory? That there's bits missing, so that if we knew a little bit more, we would know about um, you know, definite values of position or velocity, yeah. but quantum mechanics is just not a good enough theory to tell us. Could there be a more complete theory? Uh, that is a very sensible proposal, and uh, it's not just an understandable suspicion. It's a sensible proposal. It's more than a sensible proposal. It's a, a valid contemporary attitude research program in physics to understand quantum theory like that. And it goes back uh, all the way to the beginning of quantum theory uh, with, and this approach is, goes under various names, but the, uh, the best known version is called the pilot wave theory. And it was proposed by one of the founders of quantum mechanics, a French genius physicist called Louis de Broglie, who said, it's pilot as in aeroplane pilot, though he had in mind the pilot of a ship, 
who guides the ship uh, from the bridge. Uh, he wanted to say that the orthodox quantum state is uh, physically real, no disagreement with orthodoxy there, uh, but it doesn't uh, represent the whole truth. There's extra facts. These extra facts are exactly positions of particles, tiny unextended point particles or so-called corpuscles, which have at all, all times a definite position, but when you measure the position, there will be a radical distortion so that the outcome doesn't actually, even in a well-designed instrument, detect what was previously the possessed value. So you have a particle, it is in a particular place, you measure it and the measurement basically changes that place where the particle is. Yes, yes, and yet the, uh, the, out the probabilities for the various outcomes uh, do which de Broglie would uh, uh, state are exactly those of the orthodox quantum theory. So he added to orthodox quantum theory uh, the existence of definite values for position, velocity, momentum. But the, he was able to, uh, you know, this was a heterodox, heretic, uh, unorthodox view, and you have to do a bit of fancy footwork to, because Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Bohr were all saying, there can't be a, a definite value for the position of a point particle. We have had to overcome the idea of a trajectory in space. Uh, and so you have to do some fancy footwork to reconcile your vision with their prohibition. Right? And it went by admitting that the measurement was heavily distorting. And that yeah. is called contextuality. Uh, yes. And so although they didn't use that word in those days, he did have the idea that the distortion uh, made for the reconciliation with orthodox quantum theory, and it really can now be understood uh, as the outcome you get depends upon what else you could be measuring or were measuring when you measured position. So it's the context of measurement is influencing the result you get. But this idea of contextuality is weird because if it applied to the world as we know it, that would mean that if I try to measure, let's say, the make of a car, whether it's a BMW or a Porsche, um, depends on what direction I look at it from. So the context de determines the outcome. I think perhaps in the car analogy, it, it, the way to think of it is uh, in the quantum theory that one's, one has um, a dependence of your result uh, of what type of car it is, uh, not so much on whether you look at it from one perspective or another, but on what else you are trying to determine. So you're trying to measure, determine, is it a BMW or a Porsche? And the result you get might depend upon whether you're also considering, uh, what, what, whether you're looking at color or uh, age. Right. So if I'm looking, is it a BMW or a Porsche, and I also want to know the color, I'll find out that it's a, a BMW. But if I'm wanting to know whether it's a BMW or a Porsche, and I want to know its age, I'm likely to get the, or I could get the answer, it's a Porsche. That's, so it's not so much the perspective from which you ask a question, it's more what else are you also asking? Like age and type of car, color and type of car. And the type of car answer depends upon what simultaneous question you're asking as well. So how does that help? I mean, in the traditional interpretation of quantum mechanics, you have basically randomness, and particles don't have particular position, and assume those positions sort of at random when you look. And in the new version, you have definite positions, but whatever you do, whenever you measure, you change those. So is, you know, does one give us more certainty or actually more knowledge about the world than the other? Uh, well, I think in favor of de Broglie, we'd have to say it doesn't, it, it doesn't give more knowledge, uh, but it does give a clearer picture of what is going on, a more uh, completely comprehensible, lucid picture of what's going on. Uh, it, uh, it adds to the orthodoxy. Uh, the main things to add 
perhaps a little bit in a special apology or defense is that uh, it is hard to reconcile with relativity. Uh, it, the proposal was originally made for the version of quantum theory that doesn't include Einstein's special relativity. And the basic ideas of this particle having its uh, continuously changing but always actual position, uh, though the, those ideas are hard to reconcile with relativity. The other thing that uh, it was the uh, kind of uh, origin or seed for was quantum non-locality. This contextuality that the pilot wave theory makes very explicit is really uh, the origin of the of quantum non-locality. What is non-locality? Okay, well in this context I would say um, in the context, if I may, of contextuality, right? In the, in the discussion or the landscape of what is contextuality, the main thing to say is that um, it's fair enough. Oh, the out you'd think the outcome that I get depends upon the context of measurement, in particular on what else I might be or am measuring at the same time. The details matter. It influences the outcome I get. But you would naturally think that the details of some other distant measurement by my colleague, a meter away, a mile away, a galaxy away, those couldn't possibly influence the context of my local measurement and the nature of the, hit, of the distortions going on for my measurement. But non-locality is that uh, the distortions can be sensitive to what goes on elsewhere. So not only does my measurement influence the outcome, but your measurement in another galaxy could influence the outcome. Yes. That is very strange. That, that is indeed very, very strange. Yeah. Okay. So where does that leave us as observers of physics? Do we actually influence through the act, act of observation what is happening? Because in pilot wave theory, the measurement distorts the outcome. In Another interpretation is the very act of looking that somehow people call it the collapse of course, the collapse of the wave function, the particle assuming a position. Um, where, does that, where, where do those theories leave us as observers? Um, well, my own answer is I think it's, this is quite a happy ending for us today because it leaves us certainly uh, influencing the system, but not in ways that are really mystery mongering. I mean, we always knew in everyday life that, uh, you know, opening the oven door to examine whether the cake or, or is done or the joint of beef is done, you know, you're cooling, you're cooling the oven, so you're influencing the cake or the joint. And, but that's not mystery. That's, we are gross creatures and we are very clumsy and invasive from the perspective of a tiny molecule. So, uh, in both cases, for both visions, that would be the role of the observer. So it's not really a mystery. We're just big things that influence the things that we try to, to measure. understand. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.